Chapter 11 Gunhild didn't sleep well, but she was sure she had drifted off for at least a few hours. She never stopped being aware of the waves and the chill night wind, but eventually the sun rose and she realized that she had drifted in and out of strange dreams and it was now morning. She got up and tried to shake off the chill. She looked up the coastline to the north, wondering if anyone had decided to follow them. It seemed unlikely, and it probably wasn't worth it to Ragnolf to pursue her. He wanted the farm for his son, the whole farm, without having to divide it. Whether Gunhild married Geralt or whether she disappeared, the effect would be the same. With an uneasy feeling, she thought about Rolf and Brunyar, and hoped that Ragnolf hadn't decided to squeeze them out. More likely, they would end up fighting at their uncle's side someday. The poets called warriors raven feeders sometimes. Certainly, they fed ravens by leaving corpses, but it was just as true that they fed the ravens themselves when they fell. Do you want to take the fish? asked Yadav, who had woken. Let's catch fresh fish, said Gunhild. We'll make a better fire the next time we stop. They pushed the boat back to the water and jumped in, getting their feet wet again. They were still damp from the night before, and Gunhild pulled off her shoes and socks to find that her feet were white and wrinkled from the damp. She raised the sail, and it filled with wind. The wind wasn't blowing southward, but Gunhild turned the sail at an angle as her uncle had taught her, and used the rudder to keep them heading south. Wherever that will take us, she thought. As they sailed, Gunhild found that she had to stay more focused than she would have thought. The Wadden Sea was not uniformly flat across its depths. The sand made shapes and the water cut channels through it. She knew that if she didn't pay attention, the receding tide could leave her stuck on a sandbar or mudflat. Around mid-morning she wanted a rest and suggested they try fishing again. Yadith agreed enthusiastically and offered to work the net. When she pulled up the catch, she found an odd assortment of things, including a ray, an eel, and some cod that looked promising. Let's keep the cod, said Gunhild. I'm not sure how to clean the others. Okay, pass one here. The cod proved difficult to clean, though. They were small, and Gunhild's knife wasn't as sharp as it should have been. She had trouble piercing one of the cod through the belly, so she pushed harder, and the knife slipped. Before she knew what had happened, her hand was covered in warm blood, her own. Gunhild did not normally scream about anything, but the shock at looking at the blood gushing from her thumb, the flesh laid open hideously, overcame her, and she screamed involuntarily. Instantly, Yadith was at her side, wrapping Gunhild's thumb in the hem of her dress and squeezing hard. "'You'll be okay,' said Yadith. "'Calm down. I've got it.' Gunhild had difficulty controlling her breathing. She closed her eyes and gripped Yadith's knee and willed herself to calm down. "'Is it bad?' she asked eyes still shut. It's not pretty, said Yadith, but it's clean. You need to hold it so I can make a bandage. She did, and listened to the rip of fabric as Yadith cut the hem of her linen underdress and tore it off. She ended up with a strip a few inches wide and took Gunhild's thumb back to dress the wound. Keep holding it, instructed Yadith. I need to get the rest of the cod. I'm tired of being hungry. Let's pull up at that beach. She gathered the fish, stowed the net, and then took the oars. She handled them heartily, considering that they were too big for her. Gunhild could do nothing but watch and steer the rudder with her elbow. On the beach, Yadith found some driftwood and began to cut slippers from it to use as tinder. Then she pulled more threads from the torn hem of her dress and made a wad of fibers. This burned much better than the sea grass of the night before, and soon they had a fire, which they spread into a bed of coals and laid the four fish on top. How do you feel? asked Yadith. It was just... A lot of blood, said Gunhild apologetically. I guess Thor got his sacrifice from us today. Yadith seemed to consider this, then said, God doesn't need sacrifices anymore. Who? asked Gunhild. The Lord God. He already had his sacrifice. He doesn't need blood anymore. Yadith seemed content to leave it at that, although maybe she was hoping Gunhild would ask more. What was the sacrifice? asked Gunhild. His son said Yadith. Then she paused, seeming to reach back into her memory before reciting. Hevunus kuning Christ almiti, bota myth blodig ye blestod a redinger. On hali re win roda ye wounded a hungen, 
is throwing us bare, peludar fiste. Then she translated as best she could. It goes, Heaven's King, Christ Almighty, bought with blood. I don't know the Danish. It's when you're saved or rescued. She paused. What's the word for a big wood thing that stands in the ground like this? She made her arms into a cross. A gallows? suggested Gunhild. For hanging people? Maybe, said Yadith. The English word is rude. So, on the rude, he was wounded and hanged. His, um, hurting? Pain? Suffering? suggested Gunhild. Yes, said Yadith. His suffering saved us. It drove away sin. What does sin mean? asked Gunhild. It's when you do something wrong. Christ died to save us from the bad things we do. Gunhild considered this idea. So, your god is dead? she asked cautiously. This idea wasn't strange to her. The Norse gods could die, and some had died already. He was dead for three days, said Yadith. Then he rose from the dead and went to heaven. He hung on a gallows? Gunhild asked. On the rood, said Yadith, with a wound in his side and a crown of thorns. As a sacrifice? Yes. Well, that's just Odin, said Gunhild. Your Christ is the same as Odin. Yadith looked skeptical, so Gunhild elaborated. Odin hung from the world tree for nine days. That's three times three, of course, wounded by a spear. When Gunhild said that he had hung from the tree, she meant by a rope around his neck, but that's what she thought Yadith had meant anyway. He sacrificed himself, but he didn't die. I think they're the same god. Yadith pursed her lips and shook her head. No, no. Odin is not real. Only the Lord is real. And his son. So why are they so similar? asked Gunhild. They're not, said Yadith. Look, why did Odin hang on the tree? Why did he sacrifice himself? To gain wisdom and learn the runes, said Gunhild. Well, Christ hung on the cross for all of us. Not for himself. He died to save us. Gunhild considered this skeptically. So you like poetry? she asked, changing the subject. Poetry? The words you said before. The ones you remembered. Oh, shopcraft. You call it poetry? Brother Yadmar loved that one. He knew so much shopcraft. Gunhild thought of her father, but didn't say so. Was Yadmar a priest? she asked. He was one of the monks where I lived. He recited poetry and told us all about Cadman, who lived in the days of St. Hilda, who could write a poetry, a poem, corrected Gunhild. Write a poem without even trying. It would just come to him as a gift from God. Their fish had cooked by now, and they carefully pulled back the crispy skins to eat the delicate white flesh beneath. Gunhild was impaired by the bandage around her thumb and kept dropping bits of fish into her lap. She looked at Yadith's dress where it was torn and splattered with blood, and then at her own green woolen dress, now stained with a large brown blot. Don't we look like barbarians? she asked, eating on the ground. Look at our clothes. Let's hope we don't meet the king, said Yadith. Which king? Any king. Yadith went back to picking at her fish, finishing the first and starting on her second. Gunhild, however, had stumbled upon an idea. She remembered that Ragnolf had said that no one would take her case before Jarl Thorstein. Ragnolf was Thorstein's man, after all. But there were lords more powerful than Thorstein. There was even a king, King Siegfried. Surely he could overrule a Jarl. She imagined herself sailing back to Ripa with a messenger. No, two messengers, with swords and helmets. They would deliver the king's decision that Gunhild could stay with her cousins in Ripa, and Ragnolf would have no claim on her. She just needed to find King Siegfried. The man she had met last year who played the lyre, Alvar, he had said that the king was holding court in the south. That was enough to start with. I think I have it, she said suddenly. I know how to go back. We're going to ask King Siegfried to intervene. Realizing that the word intervene might be difficult for Iadith, she rephrased. We'll make our case against Ragnolf to him instead of Jarl Thorstein. We'll ask for one third of the farm, or what it's worth in silver. It's my right as my father's child. If the king says so, no one can overrule him. She smiled merrily at Yadith, but Yadith didn't return the smile. I'm not going back, said Yadith. Because of Ragnolf, said Gunhild, he won't be able to hurt you anymore, she reassured Yadith. I'll make sure of that. You'll belong to my mother only, 
or to me. I'll protect you. I don't want to belong to your mother, said Yadith, or to you. Gunhild felt shocked by her ingratitude. She thought of how kind she had been to Yadith, taught her Danish, helped her with her chores, tried to protect her from the others. But then we can stay together, she said. Ragnolf is cruel, but I'm not. I thought I was your friend. Friends don't own each other, said Yadith. I'll set you free, said Gunhild, excited. It's not my home, said Yadith. Go find the king if you want. I'm never going back. Neither spoke for a while. Gunhild watched Yadith, wishing she could read her thoughts, but Yadith's face didn't give anything away. Guilt niggled at Gunhild. I'm sorry, added Yadith after a moment. No, you're right, said Gunhild. I just never thought. It must have been awful for you. Yadith shrugged. A thought occurred to Gunhild. Do they have slaves in England? she asked. Yes, said Yadith simply. Yes, my mother's parents were slaves. Their master set them free when he joined the abbey, to show his commitment to God. And you lived at the... Gunhild struggled with the word. Abbey? Near it, said Yadith. Tell me about your family, said Gunhild, and it occurred to her that she had never asked about them before. She leaned back and stretched out her feet. She was finally full after being hungry all day, and though her thumb hurt, it had stopped bleeding and looked as if it would heal. As the midday sun warmed them, Gunhild listened to Yadith tell about her home. My home is called Heritu. Imagine a piece of land that sticks out into the sea. There's a big church that can fit fifty people. Around it are huts for the holy brothers and sisters, monks on one side, nuns on the other. Then there's a kitchen and a scriptorium, a granary and stables. Outside the walls are the townsfolk. There's a road and houses near it. Fields stretch all around, and fishermen fish in the ocean. Most of the families farm or fish, but there's a blacksmith, a baker, and a carpenter. And then we make pots. My father came from a village called Conchester, where his father was a potter. My mother's parents were farmers after they were free. My parents met when my father came through Heritu with his father. They went from town to town following the market days. I have no brothers or sisters. There were some babies before me, but they didn't live. When I was born, my father says, he went to the church at the abbey and stayed all night on the steps on his knees, praying that I would live. And I did. He told me all my life that because of that, he knew that God would always protect me. We work the farms belonging to the abbey, but my father makes extra money from the pottery. Real silver coins sometimes. We keep ducks. A lot of families keep ducks or geese. Oh, I'm getting hungry just thinking of it. I haven't had roast duck in... I can hardly remember. Every Sunday we go to church. The Holy Brothers sing, and the priest says the Mass. I can't understand it because it's in Latin, which is the language of God. But then the priest gives a sermon in English. I like Father Alfred's sermons the best. And the singing. When the Holy Brothers sing... That's what angels must sound like. Father would take me with him to the fairs and markets sometimes. He taught me to make pots on a wheel, not just by pinching them. And other girls in the village and I would play games. I could throw a stone at a crow as well as any of them. Or we would sing songs. We would cut an apple in half to tell our futures. I don't remember any of mine now. Then one day I was helping my mother cook, and we heard shouts from down by the beach. People kept shouting, and some people ran past, so we went to look, and this big ship had run up on the shore. Men with spears and shields were running up on the beach, and everyone was running, so my mother grabbed me and we ran too. We didn't even stop to call my father, we just ran. We all headed for the church, and once I looked back and saw some of the people who fell behind. The Northmen cut them down as they ran. We made it to the church, where the brothers and sisters were gathering everyone in, and when the last of us had gotten inside, they closed the doors, and people pushed against them to keep out the men. I looked around for my father, but I couldn't see him. Everyone was crying or praying. I thought, we're in God's house. He'll protect us. But then the Northmen's axes began cutting into the wood of the door, and we couldn't keep them out. The abbess was named Athelfled. She always had this strength, this grace. She came forward and said, I beg you in the name of God, take all the gold and let the people live. 
but one of the Northmen walked forward and raised his sword. Her words petered out, like he was cutting down wheat. I thought they would start killing everyone, but they didn't. There were almost twenty of them, all with weapons. They started grabbing us and pulling us out of the church, and they picked some of us and put us to one side. One grabbed me by the arm and put me with the others. When they took one girl, her father came forward and tried to stop them, but they killed him without even speaking to him. I prayed that my mother wouldn't see me, or wouldn't try to help me if she did. When they had picked ten of us and taken everything gold and silver from the abbey, their chief ordered them to the boat, but one of the north men saw some of the monks still watching us. He laughed and chased them, and cut one of them down before he got away. All the rest of them laughed, too. They took us back to the ship. We were mostly girls, some boys, all of us younger and unlikely to fight back. When I looked back, the church was burning. That's the last thing I saw. By this time, Gunhild was no longer stretched out on the sand. She had sat up to watch Yedith as she told her story, and now she reached out to hold her hand. Neither spoke for a while. I know where we have to sail now, said Gunhild. Where? asked Yadith. We have to take you home. Yadith didn't react immediately. It may not be there, she said. We have to find out, said Gunhild. It's dangerous, said Yadith. Our life is pretty dangerous as it is, said Gunhild. Come on, she said, taking Yadith by both hands and pulling her to her feet. We can get in a few more miles this afternoon. They caught more fish as they sailed and saved them for that evening. They also needed to fill the water skin with fresh water, so when Gunhild spotted a small stream emptying into the sea, she decided to make camp there for the night. I don't know how far England is, she told Yadav as they ate their dinner, but I know it's closer to Frankia than it is to here. I also know that we can reach Frankia if we stay close to the shore and make our way south and then west. If we tried to cross from here, we would probably run out of water. Drinking water, I mean. Yadith didn't say anything. She had been quiet since their conversation earlier. When we reach Frankia, we can ask how many days it is to England, mused Gunhild, if we meet anyone in Frankia. Of course, I don't speak Frankish. Do you? Yadith remained silent, staring into the dying coals of the fire. Because if it's more than a couple days, we'll need to figure out something else for food. We could smoke the fish, maybe, or trade fish for bread, if we meet anyone. Are you all right? Yes, said Yadith. Are we really going back? Yes, said Gunhild. We're really going. Yadith smiled weakly and rolled over to sleep on the sand. Quiet settled. Then Gunhild heard a giggle. If we have to cross the open ocean? If it takes more than a day? Yadith giggled more. What? asked Gunhild. Yadith lowered her voice. We'll have to pee over the side of the boat. Gunhild smiled, then giggled, and soon both girls were rolling with laughter. Gunhild went to sleep that night smiling, and when the sun rose the next day, and she saw that Yadith was already up and readying the boat, singing while she worked, she knew she had made the right decision. <laughs>